Last year we were uh, here just three days after the incident where the shark came up, got very aggressive. And we were crawling out on the rocks as fast as we can, and it was crazy. These men are on a mission to hunt down a killer shark. I'm going to use this spear, and this barb will go in, stick in his skin. Really strong current. It's good for sharks. OK, be extra safe. Target is this four and a half meter tiger shark. Recognizable by its ragged fin, this shark has a notorious and terrifying history. This animal in particular has been showing aggressive behavior to divers. There was an attack on a diver just about a year ago. The diver lost so much blood, she later died of her injuries. Get this approach wrong, and the predator could claim another victim. You know, your adrenaline's going, and you're not really thinking about anything but getting the spear point right in the right place. As the shark circles, now is the moment to strike. But these divers aren't killing sharks. They're tagging them. Do you tag the shark? Yeah. No. Victoria. It's part of research being carried out by scientists like these men and women across the globe. Underlying their work is a huge question, essential to the health of the planet. What's the best way to protect the ocean? against the devastation being inflicted by humanity. Some 340 miles off the Pacific coast of Costa Rica sits the island of Cocos. one of the world's most stunning marine protected areas. All fishing is banned here, and the pristine waters are famous for their astonishing variety of marine life. But this is no longer the paradise of ocean life it used to be. When you look at the data, I'm only seeing a fraction of what I would have seen if I had come here when I was 30 instead of when I was 60. Marine biologist Todd Steiner is part of a group of scientists who have discovered the reason for this sharp decline in marine life. Many of the species found inside this protected area have an inconvenient habit of leaving it. But with highly migratory species, they don't stay in one place. So as they migrate between their feeding areas and their nesting areas, we need to protect these entire swimways. Along these unprotected swimways, migratory species are being caught and killed. I am really, really stoked to go to Cocos. Todd and his colleague, Kevin Wang, are trying to persuade the Costa Rican government to expand the small marine protected area around Cocos Island. And there are huge gaps of ocean in which these animals are swimming, but in which there is no protection for them. So one of the things that we're trying to discover is where their migratory pathways are and where their important habitats are. By gathering data about these migration routes, the scientists are building a case for enlarging the no-fishing zone. It's critical for designing 
and managing marine protected areas. The more animals that we know about, the better we can design and manage these areas. You guys ready? Yes, we are. Today, the team are on the trail of the animals at the heart of the ocean's ecosystem, sharks. So it's really important to protect sharks because they're the top predators of the ocean. They control the entire food chain. And if you kill the top predators, you have a cascading effect that diminishes all the life in the oceans. So it's not just about protecting sharks. It's about protecting the entire ocean ecosystem. This is one of the places that has sharks. Whether or not we'll catch something, who knows? It's fishing, right? We have four tags. These tags are acoustic tracking devices. They will be able to monitor the movement of sharks along the swimways for years to come. And someone else has to write then, precaudal, fork, and total. But there's just one snag. The team have got to catch a shark first. They'll need to find, hook, and cut the animal open without hurting it or themselves. What we're going to do with this tag is we're actually going to surgically implant it inside of the body cavity of the animal. To lure the shark in, fresh bait is attached to the hook. Over the past 10 years, scientists here have tracked more than 1,200 animals. But today promises something new. For the first time, a silver tip shark could be tagged in these waters. But the shark has other ideas. Wait, let's let's let him go for a second. So let's 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 try and do this the other way. I've just made an incision and I've put in the acoustic tag. And we're just stitching this animal up. After we've sutured the animal up and it has this tag inside of it, we release that shark to go about his merry way, all the while sending out this special coded pulse of sound. And every time that transmission is received, we will know where that shark is. Hold the, the hook just right there. Okay. Thank you for remembering to take off this, I forgot. <laughs> yeah. Woo. So that was really good. We tagged a silver tip shark. Uh, first time that species has been tagged, you know, we're starting to have the beginnings of a study for this species that's really, really important. scientists have already discovered that at least three endangered species of shark and two species of endangered turtle migrate along a vast underwater highway. It stretches from the protected area around Cocos Island to the protected waters around the Galapagos Islands over 400 miles away. So we need to expand the marine protected areas and now connect these, these hot spots. We've now identified an area in between these where these animals are swimming back and forth, a super highway. Todd hopes that turning most, if not all, of this giant swimway into a no fishing zone will be a blueprint that is copied across the world. 
he and his fellow scientists have got their work cut out. Over the past 20 years, they've recorded declining shark populations, as much as 90% in one species around Cocos Island. It's part of a wider global trend that sees an estimated 100 million sharks killed each year, mainly because of high demand for shark fins in Asia. So Punta Arenas is the main uh, fishing port of Costa Rica. And this is also the heart of the shark finning industry. Randall Aroz is the man determined to turn scientific research into practical change here. He's devoted his life to lobbying the Costa Rican government to protect the swimway between Cocos Island and the Galapagos Islands. And he wants shark fishing to be outlawed. So look, they're landing some sharks right here. How lucky. That's all sharks right there. Now yeah, those are all silky sharks, but from what I can tell, this is an endangered species. Although Randall's campaigning has brought some regulation of shark finning, it's still legal to catch and land sharks in Costa Rica. All right. Constant legal battles with the government and fishing lobby have made him a public enemy for many here. This is a cat and a mouse game. As soon as we have a policy change, we have the fishermen in the Costa Rican Fisheries Department finding a loophole or contending what we're doing. You know, so we close the door, they come in through the back door, we close the back door, they come in through the kitchen. So uh, our victories never last very long. They recognize me. Hey, they got sharks, look at that. Shark tails, they're showing us shark tails. Look, shark bodies. Yeah, there you go, look, look. Acerquémonos, acerquémonos. I told you, they, they recognize me easy. He said, Randall, come over here and we'll put the shark tail up your ass. I'm hated by the fishermen. I'm not working to put longliners or fishermen out of business. I'm working to stop the shark fin trade, and I'm working towards sustainable fishing. Randall is adamant the fishing lobby's influence is the main reason the swimway between Cocos Island and the Galapagos Islands remains unprotected. And every time there's an effort to expand the protected area, the fishermen of Punta Arenas, they always say no. They're very powerful economically and politically, and so far, they've been very effective. But many fishermen here don't buy the line that the Costa Rican government is in their pocket. Pero también tenemos que entender con que Costa Rica elimine la pesca, no se acaba la afectación. Si él ha permitido a las flotas internacionales a que vengan, pesquen en nuestros mares. Fishermen here point the finger at their government for granting licenses to foreign fishing vessels. They say one of these boats can catch more in two months than the entire Costa Rican longliner fleet do in a year. No podemos competir con unas embarcaciones inmensamente grandes y en el cual su equipo es una red de casi dos kilómetros de largo por 200 metros de fondo y recoge lo que hay adentro que pueden ser 50, 60, 100 toneladas en un solo cerco. Throw in the fishing lobby's mistrust of conservationists, and it's easy to see why they are so opposed to protecting the swimway between Cocos Island and the Galapagos Islands. Porque protección es decir no pescar y conservación con hambre no llegamos a tener buenos términos. Un pescador ha pensado en que la actividad se acabe, y eso es lo que como sector estamos defendiendo. There's another obstacle to making the swimway a protected area, its size. The task of policing the no fishing zone around Cocos Island
currently falls to a team of 19 rangers. But with no powers of arrest, all this squad can really seize are nets. In estes más o menos 10 años, más o menos que tenemos de estar acá, dándole eh, guerra a lo que es la pesca ilegal, hemos encontrado y tenemos parte de ese material acá eh, confiscado. The rangers are already underpowered. Their $3.4 million radar system has been broken for months. No solamente tener el radar, tener el equipo, tener radio, tener armas, tener la capacidad de llegar, de interceptar, y también tener una comunicación clara, digamos, con, con otras eh, organizaciones dentro del gobierno. Right now, there's a 12-mile no-fishing zone to enforce around Cocos Island. But protecting the swimway would mean policing tens of thousands of square miles of water. In which case, they're going to need a bigger boat. Any attempt to conserve areas of the ocean properly brings a host of challenges. Not least when it comes to protecting the ocean from its greatest threat, climate change. This is forcing a major rethink about how marine protected areas should be designed and selected in the future. Well, we're at the end of the world and now we're going off the grid. The plane is jam packed. I hope it gets off the ground. Dr. Greg Stone is one of the leading scientists in this field, and he's taking a team to one of the most remote corners of the globe as part of his latest research. It really is one of the last places that it's hard to get to. <laughs> Beautiful, look at that. Hello, Canton. This is Canton Lagoon. We are in the heart of the Pacific Ocean. To get here, we had to fly to the furthest commercial destination that I'm aware of in the Pacific. And then from there, we chartered a plane to take us another four or 500 miles to here, Canton Island. Our closest human neighbors, well, they're up in the space station. Canton Island is part of the nation of Kiribati, right in the middle of the Pacific, 2,000 miles from Hawaii. It's at the center of the Phoenix Islands protected area. The size of California, this is one of the largest marine conservation parks in the world, renowned for its rich variety of marine life. And now we are uh, surrounded by coral reefs, we're surrounded by vast tuna herds, we're surrounded by whales and dolphins. All right, you guys have masks and uh, weight belts? You know what? It's all about air. Greg helped set up this marine protected area with the Kiribati government. Boom, 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 boom. It's like Spartica, faster. He and his team have traveled all the way out here because it is one of the best places on Earth to investigate the effects of climate change on the ocean. You know, there are so many threats that the ocean faces from humanity, overfishing, pollution, and climate change. But here in the Phoenix Islands protected area, we are so far from all the other threats from humanity that all the reef is experiencing is climate change, which makes it such a great laboratory for understanding this. And this is a critical moment. According to the latest satellite data, an El Nino may be forming, a natural event which temporarily warms local water temperatures, providing a glimpse into the future effects of climate change for the region. Ooh, it's a nice piece of coral right here. I like that. Kind of shallow. Yeah, let's, we'll go in around here. The scientists plan to record how the coral reefs here cope with a spike in temperature. They hope to find out how resilient these reefs might be to warming waters. The destruction of coral reefs as a result of climate change is disastrous for the ocean's ecosystem. So this is high-stakes research. Let's get suited up, guys. 
Yeah, this is, looks pretty good. I guess we'll probably drop in right at the bow. Okay. It looks to me like the coral's in pretty good shape now, so we're in a good moment to, to get these instruments in the water. The plan is to install around 10 thermometers on the lagoon floor. What we've got here is a long-term underwater temperature recorder that will record the uh, sea temperature every 30 seconds for the next year or two. And we're going to fasten it to the reef, and these are buoys to help us find it a year or two from now. And this will enable us to understand the temperature changes. You get into the water and you feel the energy, the, the photosynthesis, the production of these amazing corals. And you look at them, and they're so vibrant. It's clear enough, though, so you can see everything. And it's just like, wow, the ocean's alive. It's really a magical place. How was it? It's great. Coral's in good shape. Found a nice spot for the logger. I'm happy with that. I didn't see any grain or anything going wrong yet. So that's a good sign. I was afraid we'd see some bleaching already. Coral bleaching is one of the major kinds of damage inflicted by climate change. But previous research has suggested that the coral here has a rare ability to survive. We've witnessed two major bleaching events that have come through here. And when it first happened about 17 years ago, we were all so depressed because we thought that was the end of this spectacular system. Just very depressing, dead, brown, black, broken coral, and we, we almost needed Prozac to try to cheer ourselves up. It was so bad. But then it bounced back with incredible vigor. It was almost like finding someone who was almost dead get up and walk the next week. Never had we seen a reef system respond like that. With another temperature hike potentially brewing, Greg is hoping this latest research will provide more evidence to suggest that this coral is equipped to resist climate change. One of the holy grails in climate and ocean and coral research is, is finding coral animals and, and other reef organisms that can withstand the heating that's happening now on the planet. But it looks like nature might have done it for us here in the Phoenix Islands. And it could be that this has applications throughout the world. It's not an understatement to say that perhaps the progenitors of future reefs in the world could lie here. They could actually become corals that could be moved elsewhere. Greg believes scientists should weigh the effort required to set up a marine protected area against its potential benefits, which is why he would prioritize areas like this one with resilient corals. The picture is pretty dismal for rank and file coral reefs around the planet, and it's the ones that can withstand this heating, that can withstand these fluxes in the climate that we're looking for. And we've got to make tough choices now. We've got to pick those places that are going to have the biggest impact into the future. The worldwide search for those places, and for the most effective way to use them, is leading to some unlikely destinations. In the rather less tropical waters of West Wales, the question is being asked, can marine protected areas be designed not only to survive climate change, but also to help fight it? Marine scientist Dr. Richard Unsworth is hoping to prove the answer is yes. So this is incredibly simple. All these are small Hessian bags and we fill them with sediment from out there. In these protected waters, he is planting one of the ocean's less glamorous organisms, seagrass. In the, the water over the winter, it'll germinate, and by the end of next summer, we'll see mature big, big seagrass plants. What we're trying to achieve here is create a really simple way of restoring seagrass using really low tech equipment. Global stocks of seagrass have declined by nearly 30% since 1980. Richard argues that wide scale restoration of seagrass could help in the battle against climate change. Seagrasses have been lost all around the world. They're like the powerhouses of the ocean. People refer to them as the lungs of the sea. 
And we really need to bring these habitats back because they store carbon 30 times faster than rainforests. And therefore they're one part of the solution to climate change. I have young children, I, I, can't, I can't look them in the eye and know that I'm not doing something against the climate change. Reducing carbon emissions is the most important weapon in the fight against climate change. But progress has been slow, and Richard's work with seagrass is just one of several novel solutions scientists are exploring to save the ocean from global warming. Marine protected areas currently make up only 3.6% of the ocean. It's science that will drive efforts to add to and expand those areas, to select them, to conserve the rich and diverse life within them, and to adapt them to deal with the specific and urgent challenges each faces. Think of the ocean as a very sick relative. Going into your relative's bedroom and tucking them in and giving them a hot cup of tea, it'll help. But the situation is so serious, you need to hire a doctor. And we need the best science and we need the best mind. Couldn't be more urgent and it couldn't be a better time for everyone to step forward.